Hi, everybody. Um, I want to give a little uh, talk about Russell's paradox, uh, which is discussed in the last section of chapter one in the texts. You should read that as always and see what he has to say about, um, about this. There's a story behind Russell's paradox. So before I tell you uh, a little bit about what it is, let me give you a little bit about the history and then you can see why sometimes this whole set business isn't as straightforward as one might think. So once upon a time, there was a German uh, mathematician and philosopher named Gottlob Frege, F-R-E-G-E. -E. And this was in the, around the turn of the 20th century. And Frege wanted to clarify the relationship between logic and mathematics. This is kind of an old question. And it's sort of like asking the question, is there anything to mathematics beyond just logic? It, can you start with a set of axioms and apply the rules of deductive logic and get everything that mathematicians would consider mathematics? It's a philosophical question. It's not really a mathematical question, but that's what he was interested in. And to get a grip on this, he, um, he wrote down a set of axioms which look, they were similar to what we would call set theory. They, they were a, a collection of ways that you could derive new ideas from old. And he was very proud of himself for this. And he spent years writing a very thick book called The Foundations of Arithmetic, in which he was going to show that using his logical principles, one could derive everything that would have wanted to know about arithmetic. And then just as this book was about to be published, he received a letter in the mail from Bertrand Russell, uh, who was a uh, British intellectual and a mathematician and philosopher at the turn of the 20th century. And Russell asked him a question. He said, I've thought up this little amusing trick, and I wonder, it seems to cause a problem with your work. Can you explain to me how I can fix it? And let me tell you what Russell wrote to Frege about. So he said, he said, um, let's take a look at this, this set that I've written down. So this is Russell's, Russell's trick. He said, I'm going to make a set A, and the elements of this set are going to be sets. And the sets that I want to put in A are the sets which are not elements of themselves. So um, as we've seen, it's perfectly possible for one set to be an element of another set. For instance, we could make the set whose elements are the set one and two and the set one and three, no problem. But um, what about Russell's example? So it's a set and its elements are the sets which are not elements of themselves. And Russell said, um, well, this seems like a good set. I can say some things about it. For instance, I know that the integers are an element of this set because the integers are not an element of the integers, right? I mean, the integers themselves as a set consist of just numbers like minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, and so on. And in particular, the, the set of integers is not an element of that set, just the integers themselves are. And the empty set is an element of A because the empty set doesn't have any elements. So in particular, the empty set is not an element of the empty set. And so on and so on. And then Russell asked, what about A? Is A an element of A? Well, there are two possibilities. It either is or it isn't. So let's suppose it is. So if A is an element of A, well, that's a problem because the elements of A the elements of A are those sets that aren't elements of A. So A, if A was an element of A, that's a problem because it's only A is only supposed to include elements, sets that aren't elements of A. On the other hand, if A is not an element of A, hmm, then A sh should be an element of A.
because the elements of A are exactly the sets that aren't elements of A. Sets that aren't elements of themselves. So you lose either way. If you say that A is an element of A, then it can't be. And if you say that it's not, then it has to be. And you get this circular contradiction. That's why it's called a paradox. And um, when Frege got this letter from Russell, he kind of panicked because um, his, I mean, his logical system was of no use to anybody if, if, it, if it had this kind of circular reasoning in it. And after thinking about it for a while, he realized that this was a fundamental problem. He, he couldn't, it wasn't easy to fix. So he hastily added an appendix to his book in which he said, uh, Professor Russell has caused me some serious problems here and I'm gonna work on this some more and try to fix it. But um, the fix that he proposed turned out to have other kinds of problems with it. And basically Frege's life work was destroyed. So Frege, in fact, is kind of remembered in mathematical history as a person whose life work fell apart because he, somebody else found a mistake in it that he wasn't able to fix. And it's kind of a sad story. Russell, however, went on and looked at this much more closely. And after a number of years, uh, he and some other people figured out a way to kind of fix this problem and they developed what are called the zermelo frankel axioms of set theory. And these are something that you would study if you took a, a more advanced course in set theory. And basically, it fixes the problem just by saying you're not allowed to do this. Um, it puts re restrictions on when sets can be elements of themselves and, and, and essentially makes it so that you have to be much more careful about what you put on the right hand side of your set builder notation and you're just not allowed to do this. And if you're not allowed to do this, then you can't produce the paradox. And so you get a consistent system. Um, this whole um, area is where you worry about the axioms of set theory and what's allowed and what isn't and so forth is called the foundations of mathematics. And it's kind of very close to logic. It's, it's, it's basically mathematical logic. And it's, um, has a lot of interesting kind of paradoxical problems, forces you to think about things that you wouldn't ordinarily think about. Um, the story, the way I heard about uh, Russell's paradox, and let me give you maybe two quick examples of Russell's paradox to think about. The first one is the barber version. So you have a town and it has a barber and the barber only cuts the hair of people who don't cut their own hair. So who cuts the barber's hair? Well, if the barber cuts his own hair, then he doesn't cut his own hair because he only cuts the hair of people who don't cut their own hair. And if he doesn't cut his own hair, then he does cut his own hair because he only cuts the hair of people who don't cut their own hair. So it's not possible to decide who cuts the barber's hair. And, um, that's a very simple uh, kind of barber version of Russell's paradox. And the other version is a little bit trickier and it's called hypergame. Uh, so in hypergame, two people play and the way it works is the first person names a game and then the second person makes the first move in that game and they play a, a version of that, they just play that game and the winner of hypergame is whoever wins the game. So if I'm gonna play hypergame with you and I go first, I might say chess and then we would play chess and you would move first and whoever won the chess game would win the game of hyper game. Or I might say tic-tac-toe and then we would play tic-tac-toe and you would go first and whoever won the game of tic-tac-toe would win the game of hyper game. And the only rule for hyper game is that whatever game I name has to, have a, has to end with a winner or a loser after a finite amount of time. So I can't name a game which doesn't produce a winner. And then the question is, is hypergame, can I name hypergame? So the problem here is that, let's say we're gonna play hypergame, you and me, and I say, let, so I'm gonna go first and I say hypergame. Well, now you need to name a game and you can name hypergame. 
and then I can name hypergame, and then you can name hypergame, and we can go on like this forever, and therefore the game never ends. But if the game never ends, then I'm not allowed to say hypergame. I'm only allowed to say games that end. So hypergame has also a Russell par Russell's paradox version. If you're interested in learning more about this, um, you could uh, you know you can look on the web. There's tons of stuff about Russell's paradox on the web, and uh, maybe it suggests that uh, you have a future in mathematical logic. So I think that wraps up chapter one, and we'll move on to chapter two.